said, let them know that they need to walk the straight and the narrow. Let them know what danger awaits for you out there. Folks, I stormed onto that stage, and for the next 45 minutes, I poured out all the wisdom I had developed in 21 years of life. <laughs> That's right, that should have been a 45-second conversation. I then told them about the dangers after working the tough streets of Ainer, South Carolina for six months. At the end of it, they all applauded politely, and I walked with the preacher to the back of the church where I stood there, and everyone came by that night and said the exact same thing. Good job. How's your mama? That's a sign things didn't go so well. <laughs> then all of a sudden, a teacher appeared for me in that church, folks. There's an old Zen philosophy that says when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. What that means is, is that all those times I sat in class and didn't learn anything, it wasn't because I had bad teachers. It was because I was not ready to become a good student. That night in that church, they pushed a little lady up in a wheelchair, being pushed by her adult daughter. She caused a gap in the line. She was moving slowly, and it gave me a moment to call out to her. And I said, hi, ma'am, how are you doing tonight? And she didn't respond, but her daughter did. Her daughter said she's not doing well. She's been sick before, but she's really sick now. We're worried about what the future holds. Folks, I do not know why people get into law enforcement these days. But what prompted me to get into law enforcement was the belief that I could make a difference, that I could provide comfort when people were in their worst situation. It made me believe I could provide hope when it seemed all hope was lost. What I could do is provide strength to face the next day. Maybe this is why I was called to that church. I walked over to the little lady in the wheelchair. I took her by that frail little hand. I leaned down beside her and I decided this was going to be my moment. I was going to say something that would make a difference in her life. I leaned down and I said, honey, I sure hope you get better. And she looked up and said, honey, I hope you do too. <laughs> not the kind of reviews you hope to hear after your first speaking opportunity, but she let me know that I do not have long left on this planet and you just wasted 45 of those minutes, son. You gotta get better or you gotta get off the stage. Folks, I want you to know my promise to you is I am not here to waste one minute of your time. I wanna talk about the blessings that we all have all around us. Too many times when we face a new year, we think about our resolutions and what we would like to have happen for us, but we forget the blessings that have been poured down on us throughout a lifetime. So much of my life and this story started right here in Ainer, the place I'm the most proud to be. As I travel, and I've spoken from Maine to Miami, Connecticut to California, from Seattle to San Diego, there is no place on this planet any better than we have right here in our community, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for being part of my story that I get to go and talk to them about how a community should treat one another, how we should treat each other. Folks, so many of those lessons started on that little dirt road we call Butler Road now, in that home where Hazel and Truman Butler raised five children. My siblings are here today. What a blessing, the gift that they gave me. Joe was our electronics whiz. He could do anything, fix anything. Betty is our detail person. She's our big picture person. She keeps it together. As soon as this came out, this opportunity, she went to the airwaves to make sure that everyone knew about it. She was so proud of me. I'm going to hire her as my publicist after this is over. Then we have our brother Robert, he's our dreamer. He's a roamer, he's up in West Virginia, he's not here today, but I promise you he still talks about Ainer like it's the only home he'll ever have. Then we have Keith, he's our doer. And I got blessed to be the talker. You rarely break a sweat when you're the talker, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I want you to know that it all worked in concert together. Such a blessing that started so early on. Now, my dad could be tough, there's no doubt about it. He tried to keep five children in order, three little boys crawling all over that farm. And he was not afraid to be the disciplinarian in our home. He wore that big leather belt. He wasn't a tall man or a mean man. He was a loving man and a fun man. But when you did not do what you were supposed to, he believed that was part of the contract. As I started traveling up north, I found out that my friends there call this corporal punishment. We called it a beating, all right? And there was no doubt what it was when he finished. 
As I said, he wasn't big around, but he must have worn a belt that was 14 feet long, wrapped around him like a fire hose. <laughs> Pull it off and it would hit every loop. You could hear it sounding like a helicopter taking off. <laughs> and he had these words that he said. It burned into my brain when he'd go to do that. It didn't beat us because he was angry. He beat us because he was disappointed. Either we had done something we had promised we wouldn't do or we had not done something we promised we would. And he was just as calm when he would call you over. And I remember he told me one time, he said, son, the next time your mind tells you to do that, your butt is going to beg you not to. <laughs> And I have to admit, he was right. There were times I started to get into trouble, started to get into mischief, reach in that cookie jar, take that extra cookie that didn't belong to me, and my butt would speak up and say, Paul, we need to talk about this before we go any further. It's not worth it. Put the cookie back. <laughs> my mom, she was that counterbalance in that house because she loved everyone. Betty talks about it regularly. She says that, you know, most people like other people, but my mom loved other people. She loved you. She was the one who saw the greatness in us, even when we couldn't see it in ourselves. She would say, you can do anything. You are the best and the best looking. I remember she'd send me out of the school in the morning. She'd say, you're the best looking child in that class. Now, she had removed all the mirrors from the house, so we <laughs> had to take her word for it. But I look back on my pictures today, and I realize that I could not have been the best looking child in that class. She was cutting our hair on the front porch <laughs> and dressing in hand-me-down clothes that Robert had worn. Because I look more like alfalfa <laughs> than a model. But I believe my mom thought I was the best looking one. One of my earliest memories of ever being on a stage was being in a little play right here in this church. So thankful for people like Briggs and Miss Rachel Dawsey. Made a difference in my life that stuck with me throughout. Working with children and raising them up in the way that your parents had taught you to support how a community should look, not just your household. I was on a church stage. It was a Christmas play. And I was playing a little part and my mom was front row. And at the end of that play, she rushed the stage like it was a Broadway play. She took me by my little chubby face and she said, you were the best one up there. <laughs> and the best looking. You stole the show. You made it worth coming to. I'm so proud of you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think back. I didn't play baby Jesus. I was a tree, all right? <laughs> holding a cardboard cutout, but my mom knew that if I were ever going to be center stage, if I were ever going to be here in front of you today, the way to get me there would not be by telling me how poorly I performed or how small the role was that I played. Folks, my mom saw greatness in me that I didn't see in myself, and she is a large part of the reason I am here. I think about the friends in my life, and I'm glad Miss Latricia James is here because her family had as big an impact on mine as any. When she moved here from Bethune, came back home, she brought with her three boys, Danny and Scott and Brooks, and they fell right in with the Butlers. We had wonderful friends, the Whitners and the Huxes. Walter Hux was a great friend. And my parents didn't let us go play with just anyone's house. You had to be people they believed in the parents. But the Jameses fit us perfectly right in the right ages. And I think about my friend Dan one night calling me, wanting me to ride to the beach with him, and I did not want to go. But I went. And it was that night that my good friend introduced me to my best friend for life, my wife. Folks, you've got to be willing to go sometimes when you don't want to. There are excuses everywhere not to do. Not to answer the call, you can find an excuse, I promise. It's too rainy, it's too cold, it's too hot, the weather's too pretty. There are tons of reasons not to be here today. But you have to answer that call. Scott, while he was alive, was my best friend like a brother. And now Brooks, my best buddy. Someone I can depend on day and night. It's amazing to me how your friends play such a large part in your life. My family plays that part. Now, I have two daughters, Emily and Holly, both here today. And I want you to know that uh, I, f I say that's the product of all the praying I did when I was little. Four boys and a girl in our house. I prayed that when I grew up, I could live in a house full of beautiful women. <laughs> well, now I do. It's not what I had in mind. I was thinking more like Hugh Hefner did it. <laughs> But what I got was so much better for me. The blessing of real beauty, inner beauty, and supportive beauty. Thank you for that. 
Folks, family matters. How we treat each other, how we support one another, how we believe in one another, it matters. Every one of us is living one of two lives right now. Either we are still enjoying the glow and the basking and the pride of wonderful parents who loved us and took care of us and were living up to that name, or we're trying to overcome the disappointment of a parent who didn't do what they were supposed to do, who weren't there for us, who didn't see the greatness in us. But I'm telling you this, every one of us here today and out in that community has the same chance to find a loving father in Jesus Christ. Amen. When I started this business, well, I say I started this business, I'm blessed to have Foster and Sib Garner here. I was a police officer and didn't know anything about making things a business. One day when I was at the Horry County Police Department as a sergeant, a captain walked in and he said, how would you like to go to Columbia and be our bucket cup coordinator? That's a fundraiser with Easter Seals. It'll be fun and you'll get to go to Columbia. I was as busy as I'd ever been. And I said, no, I wouldn't like to do that at all. And he said, oh, I thought you would love it. I said, no, I really don't want to do that. Thank you for thinking of me. He said, well, let's start this conversation again. Congratulations, you're the new bucket cup coordinator for the Horry County Police Department. Go to Columbia. Look, folks, I went up there. I'm a good troop. I said, thank you, I'm excited. I went up there and brought my best attitude. I did not know that that day I sat across the table from a young accountant who was newly hired named Kimberly Stubbs. That's the daughter of Foster and Sib Garner. She's the one who started my business. She knew all about it. She is a parent, a loving parent, adopted three children, has one child of her own, and fosters three children, seven children in the house. She only has time to run two businesses, that of her husband and mine. I think about what would have happened if the Lord had allowed me to not go the places I didn't want to go. I'd have never met my wife. I'd have never met my business partner. Folks, at some point I need you to look around at the places, the bad experiences, the places you didn't want to go, the places you did not want to be, and look for the blessing inside. I promise they're there. He doesn't put you through a trial without bringing you out on the other side with a triumph. He just will not do it. Amen. Folks, my first speaking opportunity when this business came about outside of the South, I was working a lot in South Carolina. My first opportunity outside of the South happened in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a city kind of known to be a tough city. A friend of mine had lined up that opportunity, and he brought me in there, and he knew my message. He'd heard it before, a dear friend of mine. But before I was to walk on that stage, 125 law enforcement executives from the Philadelphia area, this was going to be a big moment where I moved this business out of the South and took it worldwide. My friend stood at the stage. He said, I know you're going to do great. I believe in you. I love you so much. He said, but this is a very diverse crowd. That's what he said. It's a very diverse crowd. He said, up here, we don't talk a lot about our faith. He said, maybe you shouldn't do the section on your faith. I told him, I said, I have to do that, Pat. I've got to. It's who I am. It's just what made me. If I never get to speak again, that'll be okay, but I can't get up there and lie about who I am. And he gave me the last bit of advice. He said, well, then maybe... You just shouldn't mention the J word. Now, let me tell you, I know a lot of dirty words, folks, but I didn't know any of them that started with J. <laughs> kind of confused me. Wasn't sure what he thought I was going to say. When I realized he's talking about the name of Jesus Christ. Folks, take the bad language out of your life, but the name of Jesus Christ isn't a dirty word. It's the most powerful word on the planet. Amen. I went onto that stage and I thought about it. Let me tell you how the devil works on you. That was one of my best presentations ever. I'm up there and I'm watching 125 law enforcement professionals from the city of Philadelphia leaning forward in the chairs, listening to me talk about leadership, talking about how we should treat one another, talking about teamwork, amazed at what I saw happening right there before me when all of a sudden it came time to talk about my faith. And the devil worked on me. 
I thought maybe I shouldn't do it. Look, they like me. I'm really here just as a leadership trainer. They're leaning forward. They like me. This could be a bigger deal. Also, my friend gave me an excuse. He told me I didn't even have to do it. I could use him as the excuse. I don't mention the name of Jesus Christ. But I just couldn't do it. Amen. Couldn't do it. I just took it. For the first time in my life, though, I was nervous as I took a deep breath and decided that if this were going to be the only time I was ever going to be on a stage, then they were going to get a heavy dose of it. <laughs> and I poured it out deeper than I ever have, folks. I want you to know I ended with a standing ovation. At the end of that, I was met at the bottom of the stage by a captain with Philadelphia PD named Ben Nash. Ben Nash is of the Jewish faith. He hugged me. He said, I love you. I love your faith. He said, I wish we could all just be more comfortable being who we are. I wish we all didn't have to hide. Folks, I need you to think about who you are. I need to think about who you serve. Because at some point, if you are ashamed to walk out of that door and proclaim the name, then it's hollow when you proclaim it in here. What we have to do, folks, is remember who calls the shots, who pulls the strings, and who sets up your success. I will return to Philadelphia this year, and it will be the 10th time that I've spoken in that area. There was nothing to be afraid of. It was an opportunity that I couldn't miss. I found out there's opportunities everywhere, folks. And it's easy to stand up here in front of you and talk about Jesus Christ. I want you to know I've even turned it into being fairly easy to stand up on a stage in front of hundreds and sometimes a thousand people and say the name of Jesus Christ because there's always that barrier in front of me. It's easy to do. But every now and then when I'm flying through an airport, 170 flights last year, 170 flights. All of them go through Atlanta. <laughs> I know. You know, that's what the old folks used to tell me. They said, when you die, whether you go to heaven or hell, you got to go through Atlanta first to get there, all right? <laughs> I found out there are people there who need the words of Jesus Christ. That's a tougher conversation one-on-one. -on -one. But I learned an incredible lesson on a little mission trip here in this church. I was so glad Linda Gerald got a chance to speak. We went on a mission trip that Brother Don Hobson had organized and Linda Gerald was in that van and I want you to know I drove that van to Welch, West Virginia. Didn't know where it was, how to get there and once I got there wasn't sure we were ever coming back. <laughs> but I do know this, every time we thought we took a wrong turn, when everyone else said, are we going the right way? Linda Gerald said, you're doing just fine. Keep going, right? It's so good to have a supporter and encourager in your life. But I learned a valuable lesson from Don Hobson on that trip. We'd stopped at a rest stop in North Carolina. And when everyone else went to the restroom, when we came out, the back door of the van was open and someone had dug through our box. I'm a police officer by nature. I start the investigation immediately. And I find out that the culprit was Brother Don Hobson. <laughs> He'd reached in and taken some of those Bibles going to West Virginia and he'd walked down to the interstate where he had noticed a group of Hispanic workers weed-eating the side of the interstate. They were sitting under a shade tree and Brother Don went and sat by him. And he was passing out those Bibles and giving them the words of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to know I wasn't as strong in my faith then and when he got back, I chastised Brother Don. I was like, Brother Don, how could you take those Bibles out of here? We're supposed to be taking those to West Virginia. Brother Don responded by saying, you don't know what this trip to West Virginia is about and you never know who those Bibles are for. You don't miss a chance to give one here hoping you'll get someone who wants one later. We pass out the Word of God every chance we get. Amen. Folks, I've used that. I've used that as my mantra. I'm going to try to do it every time I can, but I want you to know it's not always easy. I get upgraded now. I fly so much. I get upgraded to first class every now and then. That was exciting, but it's like my brother Keith said. When you're not a drinker, getting upgraded really isn't that big a deal. It's a nicer seat. But when you're flying so much, it's just one of those little perks you look forward to. And I get upgraded, and I'm shocked at the difference in the crowd in the front and the back of the plane. It's exciting in the back. It's like a carnival, all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot going on. Babies running up and down the aisle. It's amazing what goes on back there. And when you go in the front, it's more business. Those people are focused. They already have their computers out. 
They're working on their next meeting. They're either running to something that they don't want to go to, and oftentimes I've learned they're running from some place they didn't want to be. You wouldn't be, you'd be shocked how many times I've sat beside someone that I can look over the aisle and they're having a double scotch, trying to drown some pain, some pain that I happen to know Jesus Christ can cure. Amen. And you know what I do? Sometimes I look over at them and I say absolutely nothing because I'm not there yet. I realize that the reason that plane flies is safely. The reason I'm upgraded, the reason I have this career is God puts me in that place and he's putting me there for people just like that. I can't wait until I get to the arena to make a difference. I've got to get bolder in my faith. And I don't have to challenge them or tell them that they're living wrong, but they do need to hear that the blessing in my life, whether I'm talking about the friends that I have, the family that I'm blessed with, the opportunities that I get, the life that I live, the difference that I make comes through the power in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've got to get better, folks. That's my resolution. It's not to talk about what I've already accomplished. Not to talk about basking in the glow of a wonderful childhood and a beautiful church. Beautiful friends and a fantastic family. It's how do I share that blessing that I enjoy every day with someone else. Amen. Folks, that scripture that I had them choose, Acts 4.13, what it talks about is Peter and John going out and preaching and they took note, it says, it took note that they were untrained, they were unschooled. There are too many of us waiting until we get certified to start making a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to be certified, Jesus qualifies you. Amen. Look for the difference you can make. I've sat out in that. The congregation. I know what it's like to watch those talented folks come up here and sing. My gosh, Gary Altman last week and Leanne, it was amazing. The talented Altmans and the Woodles with Jackson and Molly and all, all the beautiful voices in this choir. And I know it's what it's like to feel small and think, I don't have that talent, therefore I have nothing to offer. I'll just enjoy the entertainment and I'll walk out of here and wait until next week to be entertained. But ladies and gentlemen, every one of you, this is my promise to you, every one of you has been blessed with a gift from above. Amen. Maybe that gift is talking and maybe it's listening. Maybe it's caring more than anyone else. Maybe it's being a good parent. Maybe it's being a good friend. But at some point, you got to be a good follower of Jesus Christ. Betty and I were talking just the other day and she said that she saw online where they had posted one of the little sayings, I just saw that little baby over here, Candace and Will, I love how they're parenting, they're excited. And somebody had posted that the bad thing about kids is they do not come with an instruction manual. Well, Betty challenged that with me. Whether you're talking about your marriage or being a parent, or being a worker, being a follower of Jesus Christ, being a voice in his name, you do have an instruction manual and it's called the Holy Bible. If you're ever lost, you're ever wondering, you're ever unsure, I promise you the answer is in there. The only leadership book I've ever read, and that's what I do, I go and I talk about leadership. The only leadership book I've ever read in my life is the Bible. When I run out of answers there, I promise you I'll try someone else's work. But this author, loves for you to plagiarize his words. Go out, shout them from the rooftops, look for opportunities to talk. Be the parent you wish you had. Be the friend you think you need. Be the follower and share your talents like you look at others and wish you could be that way. I wanna be a singer, there's no doubt about it. And every week when we do those hymns, my daughters remind me, Daddy, just stick to talking, all right? <laughs> just stick to talking, Daddy. That's my blessing. You're my blessing. You're my blessing. Folks, 
The one thing we all do have in common, everyone in this church and in this community, in this world, believer and non-believer, you know the one thing we all have in common is we're gonna face a judgment one day. And he's not going to ask how much you enjoyed the show. He's going to ask, what did you do with the gifts and the talents and the blessings that I gave you? That's what he's gonna to wanna to know. And all I'm asking you is to be bold enough to be you. The one who created you knows who you are. Mm -hmm. He knows you're good enough. He knows the difference you can make. Just be bold enough to be you, and that is bold enough to honor him. Mm -hmm. Folks, we serve a Lord and Savior that wants to be your biggest supporter and encourager, wants to see the greatness in you that others can't see, wants to tell you that you can live a life of happiness when everyone else has given you an excuse to fail. But what he also is, he's the king of accountability. And at some point, that's what we're going to have to face. And what I want to do is make sure that if the crowds ever quit clapping, if the invitations ever quit coming, if the business dries up and withers away, that it wasn't because my Lord wasn't proud of me. Amen. Make sure that when you leave here today, that you enjoy who you are. Every experience you've had in your life has qualified you for this moment, this day, this year, and this future. Walk out and love like never before. If you're holding on to some bitterness, some anger, some hurt, some hidden scar, what I'm going to ask you to do is forgive it. That's the most powerful thing you can do. That's true control. And if you have blessings, folks, don't be ashamed to share them. Now, in a moment, we're going to do a song. That I love, uh, it's here I am, Lord. And that's just, who, we all sit around and say, who are, who's going to save us? Who's going to do this? Why doesn't someone do anything? Folks, maybe it's you. There are three reasons to come to this altar. Three reasons. One, if you are thankful for something, if you have a blessing in your life, this is the place to kneel down and thank the person who provided it. That's called rejoicing at the altar. If you have a scar, some hidden hurt, some bitterness that you can't let go of, something that's still eating at you, that's a reason to be at this altar. That's called leaving it at the altar. And then, if you're out there and you're not feeling anything, folks, I've been there. I've sat there and not felt anything. What I need you to do is build that connection with the Lord and Savior that will change your life, Amen. elevate you, and give you triumph over any tragedy you've ever faced. That's called finding it at the altar. Amen. Three reasons to come here today while we do this song, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to know I am so thankful that you chose this opportunity to be here. I'm thankful for this opportunity. Preacher Joyce loves, like, no, that is her gift. She loves. She loves everyone. Reminds me of my mom. Loves everyone. Never a harsh word. I want you to know that she's made a difference in my life. My wife this morning was helping me get ready. She's the one who dresses me up, Molly. I have to give her a lot of credit. We were getting ready, and she knew that I was excited about this. And she said, you've spoken a thousand times. What's different about this one? I said, honey, I guess I just have to ask you, in your wildest dreams, did you ever see me, that little boy from Butler Road, coming to places like Ainer United Methodist Church with the people he admires, loves, and respects the most, the ones who made the biggest difference in his life, did you ever see that little boy from Butler Road coming up here and getting to preach in the name of Jesus Christ, the only salvation he has? Did you ever, in your wildest dreams, honey, see me, that little country boy from Ainer, going across the globe, across the globe and carrying the message that I learned right here in Ainer, South Carolina, in your wildest dreams, honey. Did you ever see me doing that? And she paused for just a second and she said, to be honest with you, I've never seen you in any of my wildest dreams. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie, that kind of hurt. <laughs> Firing the landscaper tomorrow, all right? <laughs> But she followed it up by saying this. 
that I am not surprised by anything you do, any difference you make, and anything you accomplish, because I know who you serve, Amen. and I've got your back. Amen. Folks, spend some time today thinking about who it is you serve. Think about those things that need to be done in this community, the kind words that need to be passed out, the proclamation of salvation through Jesus Christ. And what I want you to do is after you find out who you serve, think about who has your back. Look around. Usually this room is full of them. Don't be afraid. You don't have to. Be bold enough to be you. God bless you. Thank you for your time and your attention. Keep me in your prayers. I promise I'd do that for you. Amen. Bless you all. I'll meet you at the altar. Uh, thank you. Let's remain standing. Well, first of all, you can come home. So let's turn to selection number 593 and saying, Here I am, Lord, number 593.
Thank you. 